Hello and welcome to another episode of Tell Great Stories, the podcast that looks back at some of Unbound Theatre's past projects and productions. Now today we're discussing two productions, Carol Churchill's Far Away, which we performed in 2017, and an original one-act play called Leave, which debuted in 2018. My name's Robert Aldington and I'm going to be talking to some of the cast and creative team who worked on both productions. Hi, I'm Lara. I played Joan in Far Away and I wrote and directed Leave. Hello, I'm Matt Black and I'm one of the actors and probably the sound designer for Far Away and also the other writer for Leave, as well as production designer, technical lead and everything else that Lara didn't do. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Hello, I'm Dario Knight. I'm the creative producer of Unbound and I was the director of Far Away. Okay, so uh, so let's get started. So Lara and Matt, so you were both heavily involved, you know, both of these projects. So, but before we talk about them, you know, what's your first memory of working with Unbound, and how did you join the company? Well, I believe I found Unbound by searching f- just one day. I was I returned to Aylesbury after a a bit of a hiatus. I was looking for open auditions, and suddenly I found myself cast as. Tweedle D, or either, or possibly <laughs> Tweedle Dumb. One of the no Tweedles in the in the in the now legendary production of Alice in Wonderland, our, our Panto in tw- in twenty sixteen. I mean, I'd been involved in Queens Park before. I was part of the juggling club in sort of the late two thousands, so I thought I'd get involved in you know do Panto. I'd never done Panto before. Quite a straightforward transition, then, really, from juggling over to theatre. Well, I've I, I've been a street entertainer for for many many years. Um, stage was actually a, a refreshing change for me, not to be in in. What uh, to have one to have a stage to stand on? Yeah, not to not to have to act, <laughs> act not to have to have to uh, actively go out and collar passers by and say, "Look, just <laughs> sit, stand, watch." So the audience was already captured for you. So perfect, really. Yeah, it was brilliant. You had a roof; it couldn't rain on you. <laughs> Marvelous. Yeah, and I mean, it, everything was everything was there except for the actual getting paid. And um, well, at least and nobody to move you on anyway. So, and what about you, Lara? Um, so I found Unbound. Um, well, actually, it's all your fault, Matt, that I found Unbound because while he was in the throes of the legendary Alice. Um, I met him through friends at a pub and was hearing all about how the process was going and and what was going on with Alice. Um, And when it came to February, um, he said, oh, you know, they're they're auditioning for Macbeth and you've got a degree in theatre. Why don't you come along and and get involved? And um, I actually, I really had to be convinced. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Despite being... (laughs) Eminently qualified, obviously. Well, obviously, yes, totally. Um, I, yeah, I, I just kind of, I, yeah, I didn't know if I had the time, I didn't know if I had the the space and things like that. And in the end, he threw um, an, an audition uh, page at me and went, "Look, I'm going on Sunday. Come along." So I did. <laughs> so we, so we've got Matt to thank then, basically. Yeah, thank it's, you very much, uh, Matt. Well, Macbeth was the start of a lot. It, it it all started going either very wrong or very right from from around about Macbeth. Yeah, I mean, as 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 flirting goes, uh, inviting someone who you think is cute to audition for a play with you is is probably up there. Um, mm-hmm. And yes, during the rehearsal process, uh, we we were in scenes together, so we we were doing rehearsals outside of. Uh, actual rehearsals um and decided to go for pizza and now we've been together for four years and i can't get rid of him well i suppose it's better than some of the chat up approaches I'm, i've heard about so <laughs> oh i don't know <laughs> and knowing matt knowing matt probably someone better than some of his anyway so well, well I, th- I think as as we go along we'll we'll find that the theme of of doing things the easy way isn't really it's it's not really part of the operation here <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not your operation. Excellent. So, so now, look, um, 
Far away. So you, you both ended up in, in Far Away somehow. Dario, did you do the casting, I presume? You were the director? I did, yes. I think uh, during... I think possibly during a performance of Macbeth, I seem to recall, in the dressing room, I think it was cast. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it was the usual thorough, uh, thorough approach then? Oh, yes, yeah. Months and months of finding the right people. And um, it's, quite an, you know, it's quite an interesting place. Now, why did it stand out as something that you wanted to do at Unbound? Or, I mean, was it your decision and idea to do, to do Far Away? Yeah, I'd read Far Away when I was in university and... Um, just instantly liked it we we talked on a, another podcast about a number which was the other it was a double header we did two carol church plays together and um the same as far away really the dialogue is just incredible carol church writes the best dialogue and um and it was yeah it was on my wish list for a long time as a director and um particularly because we had just done macbeth at the start of the year which is a big uh in a sense very traditional play macbeth's one of the big Shakespeare's that lots of people do and yeah. I knew that at the end of the year I was going to be directing Panto which is another big production so it was nice to have something rather more unusual let's yeah, say in the I middle mean, yeah. and a bit more experimental a bit more niche and it's quite compact I mean in terms of time and in terms of cast it's it's quite... yeah I mean it's only about 40 minutes I think 40 45 minutes it's a very short play mm -hmm. and as you say small cast so it was nice to work on something that's just you and a few actors in a rehearsal room Compared to doing a big panto where you're constantly worried about dance routines and all the scenery coming in and out and all the, the other stuff. And just as a refresher for those of us who uh, may or may not have seen it, what, what's the content of the play and you know, what's the, what's the storyline? So it's centred on a character called Joan, who Lara played, um, and we encounter her during three scenes, or in one case a, a sequence of short scenes, that take place during her life. So the first is when she's a young girl and she's sent to live with her aunt who's called Harper and we discover that Harper and her husband are involved in some kind of clandestine activity linked with a, a sort of unnamed conflict that's going on somewhere in the world and then the second act jumps forward in time to when Joan's a little older and she's working in a factory with a man named Todd played by Matt uh, and they produce these enormous elaborate hats which are worn by prisoners of war on the way to execution basically as a kind of rather grotesque victory parade and then the end of the play is Joan and Todd again a little bit older going back to Harper on her farm amidst this it's kind of a kind of catastrophic war that's now gone entirely out of hand and all of nature is fighting against itself so there are references to even the animals and the trees and the weather have gotten involved in this strange uh strange absolutely abstract war so um so it's a it's sort of, you know, charming little kitchen sink drama, really. <laughs> and that was why it appealed. Uh, as I say, it was something a bit, something a bit different. It's kind of, it's more abstract. It has a very snapshot quality because you only get these three glimpses into Joan's life and her reaction, her interactions with Todd and with Harper. And it gives you a huge amount of leeway in terms of, um, in terms of interpreting and positioning the text, which is not the case with a lot of contemporary scripts, which are all under license for copyright. A lot of them are very strict about when they're set and how you have to present them. And uh, so it was nice to have something that was a bit more ambiguous in those terms. Yeah, so quite a lot of ambiguity in, in the play, really, in terms of uh, what you know what's what's actually going on there. You know, the, the strange goings on in the in the shed and. So on and so forth. So, so the three of you, how did you, what kind of backstories did you have in your minds, you know, as actors, Matt and Lara, when, when you were going through, when you were first reading the play and then working together to, to bring it to production? I think with, when you've got a play that's, that's like this, that is so open to how you stage it or, or present it, and where there are so few details, it's very much a case of you go in and you trust the text. A lot of the nuance started mm. coming out when we actually got on stage, you know, the, the three of us, uh, myself, Lara and, and Christine. Um, and we just started working through the lines and it sort of reveals itself. There's a lot of really dark humour that's not really apparent when you first read through it. Um, and, you know, because it, it is so am ambiguous, you know, it's it, <laughs> one of the appeals of it is that we don't like doing stories that say, this is a play about being true to yourself and being nice to animals. <laughs> it's, yeah, 
and and it, it offered a lot of lot of really nice moments to where we could make the audience uncomfortable and i think that was really what what came through as a theme was was just being willfully odd about it yeah what about you lara what were, what were your thoughts on first reading and developing your character and and you were you were you were joan sort of landing in this uh this strange household yeah. i suppose yeah. at the start of the play yeah um i think i i kind of echo what what matt says um i think there's there's many approaches that you can take to pieces and to theater you can be very naturalistic about it and you can you know really you can write your whole life backstory and things like that but with a play like far away i think being comfortable with the unknown is really important um you can put your own meaning into things but for some pieces i think they're supposed to be subjective and i think far away is one of those it's really important to leave room for the audience's own interpretation. Um, so while I could build some backstory and I could look at the fact that, you know, that this is based around war and I could look at other wars and how they developed and how, you know, what being, you know, drafted into the army and things like that's like, at the end of the day, it's leaving it open for the audience to really put their own thoughts and their own imagination into what's going on so yeah, yeah. <laughs> being uncomfortable with the unknown i think is a is yeah. a good and important yeah. thing so, well i mean i think there's yeah. there's it it reminds me of one of those great conversational tricks is you know somebody asks you how was your holiday and you say you don't want to know and they they will they will invent things <laughs> mentally that are far stranger and far darker than you could ever come up with, <laughs> because people's minds always go towards the worst. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I've heard it. You know, I I kind of read a little bit about about the play. And Lara, you say, you know, it is, it's a play that's kind of billed as being about mm. war, but but actually, I don't know, Dario. Maybe you want to sort of fill in this a little bit. But to me, reading it. I, for me, it's a little bit, it's about conflict, you know, generally between different others, if you like, or, or different parties. And what, what do you think, Dario? Do you, do you think it's explicitly about war or, or is it just about conflict between between different parties? I, not necessarily war. I, I think what it's, again, to me, I think, as Matt and I have said, it's really what your imagination fills it in with. But I think as a director, I was, it seemed very clear to me it's about the politics of yeah. fear. Yeah. Um, what you can be made to be frightened of, or or be made to frightened of by institutions uh, or governments. Um, and as I said, it's it's got a kind of abstract quality. And it when it begins to discuss some of these very odd opponents in the war, although the conflict is something that's always outside of the scenes that you're performing, actually that that abstract quality is fantastic because it gives you this constant sense of disconnect. Um. And the whole thing is a kind of fractured psyche. It's a deeply confused world that this place takes place in. This whole notion of what's true has gone out the window, which is uh, frighteningly accurate well, to what we're living through now. Yeah, I, um, I was I, I was looking at it, and yeah, we've heard we've heard that phrase "the new normal" quite often over the last year or so, and yeah. I think "far away" is is one of those instances where, so um, just as a part of the natural order of things now we have a weekly parade of prisoners in fantastic hats that's what's on tv on a tuesday people adapt everything about the conflict comes comes across as very matter of fact you know the elephants and the chimpanzees are on, yeah, on the same side very quickly yeah. becomes mundane yeah. and it? you can get people to accept an awful lot um and, and people adapt and there is really very much a sense of fear in the play isn't there i mean i, I haven't I haven't seen it, but I've read it, and and you do get this sense of, um, uh, as those kind of imply, what, what, how fear can be in, instilled into people, um, and um, right down to the fear of whether whether what you're thinking is that is that is something acceptable to be thought, you know, right, yeah. right down to that kind of level. Yeah, I think I think a lot of it for me was about the the kind of dangers of polarization. So of, of of alienating things that that are either different to you or that you are told that are different to you, 
Yeah. Um, you know, it starts young with normalizing people in a shed or whatever else. Um, yeah. And before you know it, everything's the enemy. Um, yeah, I mean, I felt it was, it, you know, just reading through it. I, to me, it said that it spoke a lot to identity, the politics of identity mm. and, and the conflicts. And, and then when I realized that it was written in 2002, I thought, actually, it's incredibly forward looking to it's easy to wind it forward to where we are now. I, yeah. I think in the way that Matt just did, you know, talking about, uh, you know, what's acceptable and what isn't, what's normal, and what's normal and what isn't rather than what's acceptable. Yeah, I think it's sometimes cast as a bit of a science fiction play, which in inherently is, it, it's a bit, because it doesn't involve technology or anything else, but it, it's a possible future. It's, yeah. it's people's behaviour and... I suppose it's more what you call social science fiction, isn't it? It's where could people quite reasonably end up if they carry on the way they are um and it is of all the things unbanned or things unbanned has done all the plays we've done and projects we've worked on it is the thing that is most frighteningly prescient and frighteningly still relevant i think there are other plays we've done which exist very much in their time or things like shakespeare you can apply any amount of different context to as you wish whereas this one doesn't read at all like a 20 year old play honestly doesn't it reads like something it could have been written yeah. last year yeah i i very much very much agree with that very very relevant to to what's going on so and now and now it uses this trick of time doesn't it because it, it's in three distinct time zones if you like dario isn't it the play yes so, as i say it's the three little snapshots of joan's life when she starts off like it doesn't i don't think the play states exactly how old she is but she's certainly I think a, a slightly older child in the first yeah. scene with Harper and then she's an adult and I don't think there's a huge gap of time between the second and third act but certainly the first one is quite a bit earlier than Was it a big deal for the the three of you working those those two gaps or or did the text just take you where 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 you felt was natural to go did, did you have to think much about backstory what's been going on in the interim or was it easy to slot in I don't remember having a detailed timeline written down for it. I think, as Matt and Laura said, everything you need to make the scenes work is there in the script. Um, it's not really your job as a director or as actors, I think, to work against that. And it's certainly not your job to subvert what a writer's trying to convey. And the scenes, although they are, they're, they're not, uh, they don't give you a lot of easy answers and they're not hugely prescriptive in terms of describing the world they're in. They take very much, they take place very much in medias res. Things are going on around them and you're just getting a snapshot of something. Um, but I don't remember filling in a lot of the gaps. Um, yeah. I think in terms of what you need to communicate the text effectively is really just what's happened immediately before a scene. So you might try and get a bit of context and often that's really for the actor's benefit where's the character just come from and where are they planning on going at the end of the scene? Laura, any thoughts on, on the timing thing? Um, yeah, it kind of, I think what uh, Far Away does very well is that it it's very present in the moment. You know, uh, the three sort of different times are, are things that are happening right there and then. They're not influenced necessarily, obviously, by anything that's come before. Um... And yeah, I think that helps you as an actor to be present in what's happening now immediately in the scene and maybe what sort of, you know, happened immediately before it, as a, as Dario said, um, yeah. rather than necessarily being beholden to a, a prescriptive idea of, of the world that you're in or anything like that. Yeah, and it's very much the way the way it's written. The only reason we know the relationship between Joan and Harper and is is it's a line somewhere that indicates that there's some reason why Joan has turned up on the farm. That's it. It's not we we don't have we don't have um the whole Shakespearean, well, here we have been and we have travelled thousands of miles and this is what's what's gone on all the way up to this moment in time. Yes. <laughs> everything everything that you learn is just what's happening now. Yeah. It's yes. a little bit pin, again, yeah, it's almost Pinteresque in that kind of uh you know, it starts in that kind of abrupt way, doesn't it? You know, you're a fly on the wall. Yeah, when we get to the get to the final scene, yeah, we we hear a few things that were happening a while ago, but it's all about the current state. It's it's 
you know dipping your dipping your toes into the water is a thing that's happening right now and i don't you know you can't really invent things in in those gaps to to fill it yeah yeah so um, now just coming back into the sort of real world of unbound then you know this play um I've, I've been given a bit of back information here, so Rob's got the, some facts. The, the, yes, facts. The, it's the, the first statisticians fact had in this podcast. Oh. <laughs> I've done over half a dozen of them and never had any facts. It, it's a little bit. I feel like I'm in that kind of ma- match of the day, you know, or skin of the deal, you know. Here, so I'm into the territory of you know. There were eleven plays before before this one in um, uh, performed by uh, Unbound, or produced by Unbound. And, and more than, now I'm not going to ask you to guess how many since, but more than 60 plays since this one. Wow. So, so you know, by my maths, it's kind of 15% of the way in, you know, of, of, of the life of, of Unbound. Let's put it, let's put it that way. So, um, so just, so winding back even, and it's not actually, you know, that long ago, and it's four, four years ago. Um, certainly if you're my age, that's not very long. Um, so if you were doing it differently, and I think, you know, Matt, you mentioned something about you know how how relevant it is to today. But would you do anything differently in, in this play? Uh, maybe we should start with you, Dario, as director. Would you do anything differently if you were putting it on today that you did in twenty seventeen? I would actually. I mean, as we said, because it's a piece that responds so well to the the current affairs of the day. You, inevitably, I think it's if you did it again, you would reflect a little more of the world going on outside at that time um i mean in in more basic terms i probably wouldn't perform it in the theater actually i think if i if i had my time again i'd probably set different scenes in different rooms at queen's park and let them play out something slightly more immersive with the audience moving from space to space with the actors because the whole second half uh, second half second act rather takes place in this factory floor where they're creating hats i'd probably go into one of the classrooms and use all the different resources that are there and set it oh, okay. in one of those. I'd set one of the the classrooms up to be Harper's house. Um, I'd probably use the theatre for there's this massive parade, famously this parade that happens at the end of the second act, with as many people as you can possibly get, um, which would be a very different prospect now because I mean at the time it's hard to imagine. It, in 2017, I mean we had about 12 actors and most of them were busy, so we we couldn't get a lot of people for the parade. So we did it slightly differently. We just tried to make it rather more brutal and scary now actually yeah. the amount of people that are involved in unbound we could have a pretty good parade um yeah. of a few dozen people um so that would be very different but yeah i think i'd, I'd change how i present it actually it it works really well i think and probably i do the same with a number i think it can withstand being a little less traditional in how you present it and how close you can get to it as an audience yeah. um oh. think of all the plays i've directed the two churchill ones are the are the ones I'd most like to go back and revisit. Partly, I mean, a number because I really want to do that as a full production as well as having done it as a reading. And it works very well as a reading. It's, as we said before, it's perfectly suited to it. But I'd love to go back and do that as a full production. And far away because, as we said, it seems more relevant now than it did even four years ago, alarmingly so. So I'd, yeah. I'd really like to have another go. But I think I'd do it in a slightly less traditional way than I did in 2017 what about um, what about you guys you you actors what would you do would you do anything differently you talked about following the script most of you really and um you know it's uh... um i mean the biggest thing i had i had written down uh has already been touched on with by dario is is that we we kind of didn't have enough people to fill out the parade um and i think that with more bodies involved we could have really pushed that scene you know i think we did a great job actually of of filling the space with fewer bodies and using voice and using sound to um give that kind of brutal and overwhelming sort of sensation that uh the parade kind of gives it's a big kind of shocking moment um but with a few more bodies i think we could we could really do something interesting, you know, get in amongst the audience and really kind of bring that discomfort forward more. And, and yeah, yeah, that was my big... It would cross my mind, actually. You, you could maybe even use the audience. Yeah, yeah. So audience participation. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, there's, well, there's, there's involving the audience. Matt, they wouldn't yeah. be children or animals. I mean, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, but they're, they're they're still from Aylesbury, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Okay, clearly, <laughs> clearly, clearly, part of the podcast we're going to have to cut there. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, and that's cut. <laughs> You've been listening to a heavily edited edition of Twelve. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah so okay well I, I having read it i thought it was a, a very interesting uh, and i think i i think i'd seen a part of the play maybe in the anniversary um yeah we reprised uh yeah i think you, i think you were in the hat making hat making department yes. uh, anyway so uh okay so that's um that's far far away uh very good play and and uh very very interesting and um uh takes us on to what a play a play of a similar length, actually, time-wise, um, and also mm -hmm. relatively small cast, which was your own play, Lara and Matt, which was uh, Leave. So, would you like to tell us uh, uh, what what Leave is what Leave is about, and uh, and what inspired you to uh, to, to write, and um, and how did you kind of mechanistically how did you get to the to the final script between the between the pair of you? Well, it all starts it, at Whitby. Uh, <laughs> yes. In case you're not you're not you're not aware, there is a a, a twice yearly festival of of goths up in Whis in, Whit in the Whitby Goths. Where Central. else but the world centre of jet <laughs> and all things black? But Whitby. Oh yes, uh, yeah. Famous for being the landing landing spot for for Dracula in the original Bram Stoker. Of course. Uh, but we were. We'd, we'd gone up there for the goth weekend. It was around about Halloween 2017. So after the day's festivities, we were at a hotel in Scarborough doing what young people do. He, I'll tell you what, Laura, he does not take, treat you right, doesn't he? Scarborough. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. He knows how to treat you. He lady. knows how to treat you. A couple of months into the relationship, you know, takes me away on holiday to a festival. Bye, Scarborough. <laughs> yeah. And so obviously while we were there, we were sat there staring at our phones and ignoring each other. <laughs> what uh, you and, uh, you know, I set, set the scene. It's it's freezing cold, right? We've come back. We've come back at a sort of, you know, eight, eight o'clock in the evening and it's 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 right by the coast. It's the middle of winter. It's a little bit rainy. It's freezing cold. There's a tiny TV in the room, but it's kind of, yeah. yeah. So we are sat, curled, watching stuff on our phones. And Lara found a video on her phone from Vice, um, I believe. And it was about the suicides in Aokigahara Forest in Japan. And what immediately struck us was the visuals of it. It's a forest where... There's a there's an unhealthy tradition of people who want to end it all pulling up and going into the forest with the intention of never coming back out. Yeah. yeah. And they quite often take with them like plastic coloured tape on the off chance they might want to find their way out because the whole the whole area uh, compasses don't work weirdly because of the the magnetite in the rocks. So there's this eerie forest of where people come to end their lives um, and it's it's strewn about with coloured streamers and it just struck struck us as something that was wonderfully visual and very very dark mm. and somewhat gothic yeah. yeah i mean um the video itself was was following a, a warden who is a volunteer um, who goes into the forest to try and talk to people who he comes across to see if they're okay and to maybe try and sort of say, you know, do you do you want to sit and, and talk about what's going on with you and sort of tries to, to talk them back out of the forest. Okay, right. Um, but, I mean, the, the visual of these brightly coloured plastic streamers weaving through the trees and... You know, people stumbling across personal belongings, uh, diaries, uh, backpacks, abandoned cars in the car park. You know, it was, yeah, on a, on a rainy, a rainy evening in Whitby, it 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 all struck a chord. Yeah, I think it gave us it gave us the characters and the setting, and also, I mean, we'd been involved in 
Yeah, we we both have theatre degrees. <laughs> and we we have, and for for better or worse, what that it, that generally involves is an awful lot of doing weird stuff. Um, yeah, it it was one of the reasons we enjoyed getting involved in in on uh, in far away was the opportunity to do something that would set an audience on edge. You know, we we don't necessarily set out to entertain or amuse. You know, we don't like to give people happy happy endings. You're really in it to 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 provoke, <laughs> and or to inspire, and, of course. Yes, absolutely. To make and you we think. All, yes, and we also knew that. It was probably going to be unlike anything that had ever ever gone on in the theatre before, because there's this concept called total theatre, where from the moment you enter the building, or even as you're walking in, you're part of it. You're not just a bum on a seat looking at the stage and taking it in. You're part of it. Yeah. And it happened to coincide. I think we had the idea probably several months before the one act play festival was announced i think the writing competition had been announced um at that stage yeah that was late 2017 actually yeah i think the writing competition had just been announced that there was there was a a competition for for um writing a short play um but we didn't know that it would be put on uh that the winner would would have it put on at that point i don't think um it all kind of just yeah, it all fell into place uh, around the same sort of time. We'd watched this video and we'd, we'd got inspired and then... Yeah, and the, um, the Unbound Space, I mean, um, the, you know, the Limelight Theatre, that is a is quite a good space for, for that, for audience in, involvement because, you it you know, the the, the audience are very, are very close to where the action's going on and you took advantage of the, the different entrances... So the physical aspects yeah. of that space are quite good for that kind of approach, yeah. aren't they? In some ways it's limited, but also because by this stage we had we had a relationship with the theatre and a and a and a creative director who was who was very much on board. We we had access to to do things like string string leaves up to the ceiling and build things that would would involve people and strew leaves across the entire theatre. Mm. Yeah, it was it was good to know that we we could envision it, and I think the the email we got after we submitted our our proposal for it was, oh hell yes, let's do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think you know being uh, familiar with a space, uh, you know having having done several performances and, and several different shows by that point um, in the space and seeing. You know how how Dario goes about transforming the space. Um, it kind of lent itself to to us going. Well, let's push that. Okay, so let's we we know what the space is like and we understand how the space works, and how can we elevate that? How can we show people something in Queens Park that they may never have experienced before? Yeah. Um, total theatre. It, it can be a little um, arty farty, shall we say? Um, and it it doesn't lend itself to community theatre and to um, you know giving people an experience that uh, isn't just Shakespeare. Yeah. Not that there's anything wrong with Shakespeare, but you know, sort of broadening people's horizons and, yeah. and giving them something to think about. Yeah, I think I think a lot of amateur theatre does tend to play safe, and with Unbound, we've been incredibly lucky to to have a have a theatre and and with Dario in, in, involved uh to be able to take chances on productions that aren't perhaps going to be you know i think what's the what's the oh one day we'll do an Alan Ake play <laughs> yes <laughs> uh, <laughs> and in, in in the yeah so i mean in the nuts and bolts of it how do you go about i mean it's it's a tremendously deep and serious subject isn't it and and um you know, so how how did you go about writing something that is so uh, you know such a, a serious subject matter as as a as a pair? Well, I I think that um, if if anyone out there ever wants to uh, test their relationship 
and you know really find out whether the person that you are dating is marriage material uh, <laughs> then you should write a play together and uh, see how that goes <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I do think um, because we, again we came from a from a reasonably common background and uh, in terms of the subject matter we are very heavily involved in the gothic subculture and always have been which means that we have experience of things like mental health suicide we're used to having these conversations and you know fitting it all into a framework i think in the initial in the initial you know we wrote we wrote an introduction and then that was interesting we in, introduced a few characters and then Largely, I wrote most of it at work. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I'd, I'd actually just moved away, uh, away from Aylesbury to to Northampton, to a job where I was I was very very bored during the day. <laughs> but I, I sat at I had a I had a corner desk and nobody could see what I was doing. So over the course of a couple of weeks, I would sit there in the afternoons and just grind out the story. We. So you yeah, ground out the story basically, and then Lara put it right. Is that is that what you're telling me? <laughs> well, uh, you know, as we've both said, we've we've got similar backgrounds. Um, mine was was more towards devising theatre, creating theatre. So having a collaborative process with someone was something that I had done before. Um, doing it remotely, considering that we saw each other once a week, if that. Um, that was an interesting challenge, which I'm sure many people now can appreciate. Yeah. Um, and you know, we we had a Google a Google document. I think was it OneDrive or something. It's either that, or we ju we were just emailing a script back. Emailing, and yeah. And it would be, you know, I I would write a a chunk and and send it over to Matt, who would then edit it and send it back, and then and you'd I'd edit it back, read it. And I'd grit my teeth and I'd, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'd edit it and I'd send it back. And, it, you know, and it, yeah, it was it was a process of building on what one another had done and talking about, you know, if I had changed something, why? Yeah. Why I felt that was important. Yeah. Not to justify it necessarily, but within the grand scheme of what we were doing and trying to achieve, that communication between us was really important in in building something up together. Yeah, I think we were also very aware that we had half an hour, maybe 40 minutes if we pushed it. And editing it down, we really didn't have any any space to just let loose. It had to be pared down to its absolute essentials to get across yeah. what we needed to do. So we had to be ruthless and we both understood that. If, if, a, if a big chunk of it got lost, if half a scene was dis was discarded, it wasn't anything personal. It was just because we <laughs> needed to do it. We needed to get right down to the to the absolute heart of what we were doing. Yep. And I think in doing that, we we really did manage to come up with something that hit mm. pretty hard, pretty fast, and didn't have any fat on it. Yeah. yeah, really distilled the essence of what we were going for with that limitation. Yeah, which I think yeah was helpful. So um, now, technically, there was a lot going on. You know, you mentioned the leaves, and I certainly, having the experience of sweeping leaves on my on that stage myself in a in a in a play, I had considerably less leaves to deal with. But in your production, I mean, there was a lot going on there, Dario, wasn't there? I mean, there were there were leaves coming down from the ceiling. There was a huge bag of leaves. I finally realised I was watching the um, the video uh, suspended. <laughs> Uh, yep. There were tents involved, various props, things being tripped over at strategic points on the stage, and people are winding and unwinding tapes for each other to, you know, to trip over. So, Dario, so a bit of a director's kind of tripping hazard nightmare, etc., and, and pretty technically involved, really. What are your memories of, of trying to make the whole thing work smoothly? Well, my memory is that I didn't have to, which was... Um... <laughs> Uh, it's yeah. a sort of <laughs> blessed relief really um because it was my memories of leave are quite hazy it was that whole season i remember being insane it was the it was the busiest we'd ever been i mean subsequent years have been even busier but um 
now I look back and think, oh, it's barely anything. But yeah, at the time, used to it now. We would do, I think we did Antigone at the start of the season. Two weeks later, there was Marvin's Room, which was another full-length play. Two weeks later, we did the Drama Festival, which included Lee, which was six different one-act plays. Uh, a week after that, we were in Milton Keynes doing a performance about the First World War. Three weeks after that, we were doing a sketch show for the sketchbook. And three weeks after that, it was Panto. So yep. <clears throat> I must admit, it was one of those moments of great relief knowing that i didn't have to be that heavily involved <laughs> and matt and lara were very happy to go away and make it all work themselves so my my memory of it really was that i would see matt and lara i think during panto rehearsals because we were already working on yes. that and every so often one of them would come to me and go can we cover the stage in leaves and i'd go yeah it's fine it will you know fireproof it'll be fine yeah go on um so that's fine yep. and then this is can we rig up some leaves to fall from the ceiling said, yeah fine just you know have a chat with yeah. Steph and he's the technician make sure it's you know not near any lights or anything It'd be fine and then there was I think the last one was we've got hundreds of feet of um color tape we're going to attach them to fishing lines and have them sort of appear over the audience's heads and going around the audience and around the stage and wrapping around I said can we do that and I went <laughs> yes yeah don't block a fire exit fine um yeah. So I quite, which I like, I like that part of my job is that people can come in, can we do this? And I can just go, yes. Um, yeah, if you can make that work, sure, go ahead. Yes, if if you have, you crack on, but by all means, as long as you're not setting anything on fire or causing a problem, you're fine. Um, so my main memory is is that I'm be looking forward to seeing it. Um, I'd read it obviously because <laughs> I commissioned it, but um, so... I did forget to mention as well. You know, you mentioned Panto, but. The... Of course, there were trees involved because it was a forest. So, so you had three, uh, you know, two or three trees on either side of the stage. Which, looking at the video, as I said, I didn't see the original. Show, they did look like real trees, you know. And I don't know where they they were. Yeah. yeah. So you also had, presumably, you know, I mean, thank you for bringing soil into my theatrical space. Ah, uh, no, they uh, were et very cetera, tactically. Et they were very strategically. Uh, no, they were, they were theatre trees. Yeah. <laughs> They'd been lopped off of the tree and then set into a. Uh, sort of a, sl- a bit of log, I think it was. So they were all freestanding <laughs> yes. things. So no, they weren't real trees that had been planted. Um, there right. was, there were also there were all sorts of insects and things we discovered. I think afterwards, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a couple of caterpillars. Yeah. We uh, we we actually because it was a sort of autumn time. Um, Matt went out with a bin bag and f- filled it full of uh, autumn leaves. Um, I think he had two bin bags in the end, didn't he? Well, thing is initially. Because the way we decided we were going to work it was that Lara would take care of the directing and working with the people and <laughs> getting the actors together. <laughs> Why oh, am this I is not often surprised a, that that was This the is often a theme. It's complimentary skill sets is the word. Yes. Whereas, whereas I would take... Producer. And the guy that normally juggles fire and builds computers would stick with the things. Is that it, Lara? Yes. Yes, I... I <laughs> I, I know I know where my where my talents lie, um, but yeah. In, initially, I bought I bought about five thousand silk maple leaves, and believe me, they they come in a tiny little package, all vacuum sealed together. And I had to sit there throughout an evening, peeling them off one by one by one by one. But yes, we had to we had to come up with. I, I soon realised that I even I couldn't afford to to do the, the whole thing with artificial leaves. Um, and yeah, I had to, had to start actually putting the call out. And we had, we, had, we had various members of the community come up and say, I've got leaves and it's about that time. I, li- part of it was also just driving around Northampton and going, the leaves falling yet? Are the leaves <laughs> falling yet? Are, are, okay, the leaves have fallen. Are they dry? Is this a dry day? Can I go out and, and park by the side of the road and fill up several several sacks full of dry leaves. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and then, dry leaves can be found, sure. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it didn't stop there because you know you get the leaves and they're pretty dry, but they've obviously been outside and it's autumn. So then the the leaves had to go through the oven. So the leaves were dried out as well. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We... There was a process. <laughs> yeah, it was. I mean that the the leaves themselves were challenging. Finding a way to drop them from the ceiling, that was yeah because that was the, fantastic. You know there was more than one 
there was more than one form of leaf drop I noticed during the production. <laughs> Sometimes there were one or two or three falling in a you know a strategic, obviously carefully chosen moments. And then at the end there was a ma- there was a major dump going on. So <laughs> well, how, how did I that have... work? Essentially, I built a a contraption out of an old bed sheet, some PVC pipe, and some fishing line, whereby there was a sort of a, a pouch that was suspended with fishing line that went all the way through the pipe and then up to the up to the tech position in the theatre. Right. And it was, and I stood there, and of course we 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 rigged this I think in the afternoon, and we didn't really want to want to test the whole thing out. Um, so I was sat there and there are, there are certainly points in the script where it says a single leaf falls from the, falls from the, from above. <laughs> and I just had to, at which I point just, the tech guy reads the script and phones up the director and yeah. uses fortunately, strong I, language. Yeah. Fortunately, I was the tech guy. <laughs> and <laughs> at which stage I have all these, all these strings and all these fishing lines. And I just, I just, twanged one of them and a single leaf fell i just went yes this is going to work (laughs) and just all the way through uh, because it's designed to build first it's just a leaf and then a few more and then as we get on through the play eventually it ends with um our character just in a in a swirl of leaves and uh, the the colored streamers the colored streamers were the bits that didn't quite work because they got tangled and that was always going to be an be a risk. Yeah, it's very difficult. It's very much a one shot effect. Mm. Yeah. So your overall but, abiding memories of the of the production, having been there obviously from uh, from the from the start to the to the end. Well, there are there are two. Um, the first, I think, was you know we 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 touched on the fact that this this is about mental health and obviously me and Matt had conversations about our mental health and, and things that had affected us in the past. And I I had a heart-to-heart with the cast um, while we were doing the read-through, the very first read-through, and they shared some of their experiences with mental health and things like that as well. Um, and the first time we went through the scene where they are sat outside the tent um, and our two characters are sort of had, having having their own sort of heart to heart about how they feel it it kind of there was a goosebumps moment where you're hearing words that that you've slaved over of course um coming out of someone else's mouth but with their intention and it was it was then that it really took on another dimension and it felt like something otherworldly yeah um and that was a really kind of that was an important moment for me as a director because it, it switched my brain from from writer to director, uh, which is an important uh, process that has to happen because you can't hold on to the words as you've written them. Um, you have to evolve with the production as it as it goes along. Um, but more than that, it, it it was watching the cast really connect with what was going on. That it was it was a really profound moment yeah so really yeah. you know because the the play is dealing with with such a serious uh subject and and and, and so closely aligned to the human condition you know yeah. and and it just shows you uh you know that's what theater's all about isn't it, it it's a, it's about human sharing experience uh, and and reflecting uh, reflecting upon them yeah. but my second one is much more lighthearted um and i think it was a celebration for the whole cast um, because even we were just touched on the streamers, um, we'd had a, a couple of tries at getting the streamers to work and it had been 50, 50 about whether they'd even work at all. And, um, during the performance they did. And that was a, that was a moment that we did all celebrate afterwards because it had been a lot of work on Matt's part, yeah. trying to get these streamers to run down the length. And while it wasn't perfect, it was enough of an impact that that it was worth celebrating. Yeah, yeah. I think there's there's certainly something about when you try and do something that is intensely visual, and you know we we had been, I I'd been f- trying to find a tent and getting a lantern and 
organizing ways for people to get in and out and create a little bit of little bit of magic yeah and the only time we actually saw it work in situ it was a single performance was when we was when we ran it yeah i mean that 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 really was it for me it was where i knew what was supposed to happen i was never going to get to see it from from out front and just enjoy it i i was up in the tech tech box and it's looking down and seeing seeing a tent with a glow inside it and seeing the leaves fall from fall from the the, the trees um and just again that it was it was even possibly one of the first times i'd seen i'd seen the whole pr- whole production as lara had done it yeah i think still one of my favorite lines and the favorite bit we ever wrote in that was there's a there's a line when our two characters are sitting on a on a bench and it's you're not happy, are you? And she just answers, no. But I'd like to be. Dario, what's your overriding, uh, en- enduring memory of the, of the production? The, the overriding memory I have actually is, um, is the commission. And it probably was that email of signing, signing off saying, yes, we'll do this. And because you're always working X number of months ahead and you're always looking things in terms of a season or a year rather than an individual project a lot of the time i remember signing that off and looking at the year we had both the things we'd done in, during the spring summer and what was happening in the autumn winter and i think it was the first time i sort of looked at it and you could see absolutely in the space of a year the breadth of what we can do as a company so that you can do big mainstream things like a shakespeare play and a pantomime you can go out and about and do things like Wind of the Willows and the World War One show. You can have other companies like Antigone with Aunt, uh, Benedict Productions coming in and working as a co-producer. You can have first-time directors coming in and doing things like uh, Marvin's Room, Sean. And you can have brand new writing as well. Writing yeah. written for that space, as we've said, about a very serious subject and, and talks about it in a very open and honest way. It's not a a saccharine approach to those kind of subjects it's not something that's trying to boil it down to an easy answer yeah so my abiding memories is just being really pleased and proud of the company that we could get to that stage where we had that breadth of work and i think it also gave us some some uh, nice connections in the community as well uh because we actually raised some money for aylesbury mind um we produced um a, a program which had local artwork about depression and poems some poems written by the cast members when they were going through depression and um we sold that alongside uh the the leaves that we were using oh, wow. as a bookmark great um and all profits went to to Aylesbury Mind and that was a really nice connection to build yeah. um yeah. in the community and supporting supporting the community yeah. so that was that was lovely as well and what other, uh, so normally, uh, you know, towards the end of these podcasts, uh, we're asking uh, the guests what your abiding or fondest memories of working with Unbound is as a, is a whole. Do you have anything else to confess, you two? <laughs> well, I think the thing is, for, from my side, from getting involved as, as, a, as a Tweedle, I have, I've really been able to to do an awful lot under the Unbound banner. Um, I think Far Away was the first time I constructed a, it wasn't really a soundtrack, but there's, there was certainly an audio, there was, there was audio production I did for that, which involved you know mixing together screaming bunnies and wasps and, and water. Yeah. Uh, from there, I've moved into, you know, I've, I've scored an entire pantomime. Yeah, I've, I've operated sound and lights. We've been out in 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 the woods, and I've I've set off fireballs. And you've written a, a very impressive Jethro in drinking song for Roman Galleon in the style of Jethro <laughs> Tull as well. I must uh, I must say yeah. for uh, Anthony and Cleopatra, uh, Matt. Which well, I mean, a- Anthony and Cleopatra was was fantastic, and I'm sure my neighbours absolutely hated <laughs> that, um, spending. <laughs> Yeah, because the entire soundtrack was was me find, finding the biggest, loudest drums I possibly could. Um, no, it was it was it was an excellent soundtrack, I have to say. Yeah. yeah. Well, for sure, Matt. You 
sincerely, you are a man of many talents, and and uh, and uh, so I think Unbound has obviously it's given you qu- quite a few opportunities to to explore them and expand them, hasn't it? Really. What, what about you, Lara? What, what's your uh, what, what's your fondest memories of Unbound? Do you think so far? Similar, I'd say so far. <laughs> so far, similar to Matt, it Unbound has has really given space to explore myself as an artist, to explore things that you know I've never directed a pantomime before, and until I <laughs> until I got involved with Unbound, and you know it it gave me space to to explore myself creatively and to also, um, you know, help other people to explore, uh, as a director, yeah. um, and to help further the company and, and their acting skills, which has been, it's been great to watch people sort of blossom and grow. Um, my, my abiding memory, however, is, is probably, uh, really finally understanding the phrase, the show must go on. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Which was invented for you, may I say? I I think it may have been invented for me. So I was I was directing um uh the was it the snow the, the sword and the, the sword stone. and the stone that was it I can't remember now there have been too many the sword and the stone and um we we got a phone call on the Wednesday evening. Well, I got a phone call on the Wednesday evening from the lady who was playing Nimue, who was Merlin's assistant. Um, and we were due to go on Friday uh, for a show. And <laughs> I got a phone call to say that she was in hospital. Oh. And there was no way she would be out of hospital in time. She was really quite unwell. Um, and the the understudy that we had was out uh, doing her own performance for her um, coursework at the time. So we had no Nimue and she is a core part of the show. She is a main character. Uh, she's in pretty much every scene. She has three songs <laughs> and uh, we had yeah, about 48 hours to figure something out. Um, and as director, I went, well, I've sat in all the rehearsals, so I guess I'll be going on the road <laughs> to Zimwe then. Brilliant. And in 48 hours, I learnt 60 lines, three songs, a dance, and I went on stage and I delivered the entire thing. Um, whilst also dealing with one of our cast members who got stuck in London, that same evening, um, he was doing some shooting uh, in London and uh, we got a phone call to say that he might not make it for the first act due to an, uh, an accident on the motorway. <laughs> so I am trying to learn lines, uh, a dance, also find myself costume because I was a slightly different size to our Nimue, and plan a new first act using some magic. <laughs> to replace another main character who, who wasn't around. Um, but luckily, who did show up um, five minutes after we were due to go on, we delayed the show because we knew he was, wow. he was en route. Um, and I went on and, and did Nimue, and it's, it's a complete blur. I don't, <laughs> I, don't, I don't really remember it. I remember starting the show, and I remember being in the foyer waving goodbye to all the boys and girls afterwards. and. Uh, someone coming up to me and going, oh, I just heard that you were a stand-in. Well done, I'd have never known. And I just kind of went, wonderful, <laughs> brilliant. That's all I wanted. That's, <laughs> that's a result. Just, yeah, that was, um, that's that's something that, that will stay yeah. with me. I, just, I don't know whether the fear has just etched it into my brain or <laughs> or what, but it was it was fantastic, not only because of my achievement, but because the way the cast rallied round. Yeah. I think Un- Unbound is a is a company forged in fire and panting. <laughs> yes, <laughs> completely. <laughs> well, on on that note, I think we, we on that famous quote from Matt Black, I think we can. Yep. Uh, I think that's the title of today's podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's the title of my autobiography. <laughs> <laughs> that that brings us neatly to to conclusion. I think so. Um, thank you, Lara. Matt and Dario, 
uh, for your thoughts and, and your memories. And thanks to everybody for you who are listening in. Um, for more episodes of Tell Great Stories and lots of other great audio and video content, you can always head over to unboundtheatre.co.uk or you can look up uh, Unbound Theatre on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram or SoundCloud.